Oh my god, it works. So, we are live again. Thanks everyone for joining. And uh, I'm sure that you're pretty much excited, which, uh, which indicates that there are more people watching now than uh, some of previous episodes. So thanks again for joining and thanks for finding time because for some of you guys, I know it's already dark and it's already late. And I'm not talking uh, about people in Norway like me, but I'm talking about people who are actually in US. So thanks for joining. Well, we have a special episode today. As uh, always, I try to find new people and uh, this time I was really, really glad to have Sebastian joining us and we will hear about Terraform CDK project in a bit. Just before that, I want to uh, explain a couple uh, points and uh, let's start with this one. So the sponsor of this episode again is M0 and uh, they have some new stuff coming out pretty much every day. And this time they integrated Slack notifications into their pipelines so that if you're using Slack, you can see how your deployment uh, is happening inside of your Slack. So you will receive a message when something happens or when something failed and uh, you don't have to leave your favorite Slack workspace uh, to know that. I think it's pretty cool. And uh, if you don't know what is M0, uh, well, you should go to n0.com slash Anton and then you can open free account and uh, uh, see how you can run uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline with Terraform. Okay, so thanks for that. Next one. Next one is uh, advanced hosting. Uh, I found this project quite interesting uh, recently because... Uh, we are always talking about AWS and how cool all these uh, AWS services uh, are and how, uh, how easy is it to innovate with all, of, um, with all of new things which AWS is pushing to us pretty much constantly. And now it is AWS reInvent. And uh, Advanced Hosting is uh, one of these companies which is thinking about uh, using Terraform but manage more uh, traditional set of services, I would say. Well, they also have a bunch of other services as well, but uh, you can see how they do this uh, uh, using Terraform as well. So they have Terraform provider, which allows you to spin up and manage different infrastructure resources. And they're also official partners of HashiCorp. So give them a try if you want to, <clears throat> if you want to manage your on-premise data centers. Well, I think there are still some people and uh, they're also from Ukraine. So. That's it. And uh, last week, or not last week, sorry, this week, a couple of days ago, uh, there was pretty uh, uh, exciting announcement, I would say, by GitHub, where they now allow organizations to support individuals. So if you work in a company and you, you don't want to pay from your own account uh, to support my work, you can do this from the organization. So you go to github.com slash sponsors slash Anton Babenka. And then inside of this page here, you can see sponsor as, and there will be list of your companies where you, um, where you belong to. And then you can uh, say that you want to support my work because I've been doing some things here and uh, you appreciate my, my work for this amount a month. I will be very happy if you do this. And uh, there are 12 sponsors right now, but uh, in total, there were about 50 people who support me uh, on very different uh, stages of my career. So thanks everyone for that. Well, um, the next part which I want to go or which I usually go, but this time I don't think I have to go is related to, well, not to Sebastian, <laughs> is related to what's new in Terraform. Well. Some things are new, some things are happening, but uh, they're not really relevant. So if you, if you are upgrading to Terraform 0.14 uh, and you have some difficulties, well, you're not alone. Uh, you have to go to issues and open new issue or maybe find issue which is already there and upload it. Because uh, I hear from people that there are some difficulties and uh, it's not so straightforward in some cases. So that's pretty much it uh, about 
traditional things which uh, I usually go. Now let's talk about Terraform CDK and the author of this tool. So uh, uh, Sebastian Korfman is recently uh, or has recently joined uh, AWS uh, Community Heroes and uh, well, uh, <laughs> let me just plug him in and I'm sure that we will we will have, well, where is it? Yeah, here you are. Cool. Uh, now, now, we hey can see, now we can see you in small window and we can compare photos, right? So guys, uh, is this Sebastian? Well, looks, looks right. Good. <laughs> yeah, it's, the photo is like a bit dated, um, but yeah. Um. Great. <laughs> so, so Sebastian uh, is uh, the first representative of uh, DevTools category which uh, AWS uh, announced recently. Uh, and uh, as, I, as I like to say is that uh, Sebastian, as well as uh, Tushstein, uh, who is also working with uh, AWS CDK, they have created their own category just because why not? So uh, AWS heroes had uh, community heroes, container heroes, serverless heroes, and then, hey, here you are. There are people who are doing something with dev tools and Sebastian is one of these. Great, so uh, welcome to this um, stream. And uh, well, today we will talk about, uh, about uh, Terraform CDK or CDK for Terraform. I personally confuse these two words back and forth every time. And uh, well. Yeah, I think the, uh, yeah, well, thanks for having me, uh, first of all. Um, I think, yeah, sure, the name is like a bit confusing. Um, I think the official name is CDK for Terraform. Um, which follows the naming convention of CDK for Kubernetes and um, well, and AWS CDK is like a bit like a different case, but I'll always uh, well, switch those names as well. Yeah. So like, right? Uh, yeah, that's. Let, let's move uh, a little bit uh, backwards, and uh, can you just uh, introduce you in a very short uh, way? Because not everybody uh, knew about uh, how did you end up with Terraform CDK in the first place. And as far as I remember, you worked on something, something similar in that area, right? Or yeah, something. exactly. Um, um, <clears throat> you're right. So I've been following the AWS CDK for a while. So like pretty much since its inception, like two, two and a half years ago. Um, and well, but I was in a project which was pretty heavily using Terraform, uh, like a migration from on-premise data center towards AWS. Um, and like to, towards like at the beginning of this year, like roughly I think in March or so, um, the AWS CDK team um, created a spin-off, so the CDK for Kubernetes, which I just mentioned. Um, and like as part of this, they extracted parts of their logic, which they built up for the AWS CDK, like the core components, extracted those as different packages, um, which made me think, well, okay, hey, if they did this for CDK for Kubernetes, uh, perhaps let's, you know, let's experiment uh, if this would work for Terraform, which also similar to Kubernetes or the AWS CDK will just generate some sort of configuration, right? Uh, CloudFormation or um, those manifests for Kubernetes or in Terraform case, HCL or HCL JSON, which I did. And it was uh, well, having a blueprint with uh, CDK for Kubernetes uh, those extracted packages, which we talk about in um, probably back a few minutes, I guess. Um, it was pretty straightforward to get this off the ground. Um, so it took just a few evenings, basically, to get something working, which was very rough and, you know, like a really early prototype. But what was working, it created some buzz uh, on, on Twitter, uh, which then uh, got me involved in discussions with people from AWS, people from HashiCorp, and well, they were saying, well, you know, uh, we're actually working on exactly the same thing. Um, how about we join forces and, you know, just push it forward together. And that's what we did. And then a few months later, we actually launched it publicly, um, which was, I think, in August. So it's always, yeah, it's all already like a few months ago. Yeah. Yeah, time flies def definitely. Yes. Um, and uh, can, can you explain um, for people who are not familiar with all of these CDK things, uh, what are the relation between AWS, CDK, Terraform, CDK, Kubernetes, CDK? Uh, what is actually a part of AWS 
or uh, who, 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 who writes what. Because there is big confusion yeah, right. between all of this. I know a few people associate CDK as something by AWS in first place. And uh, that's why there is Which is true to some extent. Azure CDK <clears throat> also exists, right? <clears throat> yes. So, so there's some like a very, very early prototype, uh, more like a proof of concept for, for Azure as well. Yes. Um, I'm not sure like how far this will go, but um, it's certainly interesting. And I think like the, well, the CDK itself, I mean, sure it was initiated by AWS and um, the, like the core components are all, um, are, are by AWS as well. So um, this is the context package and the JSI package, which are the central components. JSI is responsible for distributing and creating um, the polyglot libraries, you know, for the different target languages which we do support, where the constructs package is really well, the programming model, like essentially like a tree tree thing, you know, where you can um, create like a resource tree and stuff like this and navigate it and synthesize it and have certain hooks and stuff like this. So this was extracted from there. But like the individual products, um, AWS CDK, Kubernetes for C uh, CDK for Kubernetes and CDK for Terraform, these are really individual products um, and they, they share these common packages. But besides from that, they are pretty much on it on their own. So there was some tighter integration between CDK for Kubernetes and AWS CDK recently. Um, so which essentially allows you to create a Kubernetes cluster via the AWS CDK and you know create services and um, uh, I know workloads essentially and define them via the CDK for Kubernetes. There are similar plans in the other direction. So first of all, from CDK for Kubernetes towards Terraform CDK. But I think from, from my point of view at least, what's really gonna be interesting if there was a way to leverage the abstractions which are built upon the AWS CDK and make them usable as part of the Terraform CDK as well. Um, so, and not really as a CloudFormation stack, but in, as actual Terraform resources. But we are not there yet. There are like, you know, like a few ideas uh, flying around how this could work. Um, but yeah, it's like, in, in all the cases, it's quite a lot of effort to actually do this, um, but this would be nice. Yeah, uh, talk, talking about efforts, uh, I can see that it's definitely a lot of work to to do, uh, let's say, to do even one of these projects, let's say, stick to AWS and uh, allow to describe infrastructure in programming language, that's it. But AWS CDK team, uh, went further by um, open sourcing GSII project, which yes. uh, automatically increase um, uh, increase uh, popularity because people uh, prefer to write in different languages. Can you talk about uh, uh, about GSII? What is it, or maybe how you use it? Yes, sure. Um, so I think that this was um, the first package which I actually created um, for the AWS CDK. Um, and it's really not, it's not really bound to the CDK itself um, or to, to the product. So you could essentially use it um, to create polyglot libraries for any TypeScript based um, project, right? So it's not really, so it's, if you, if you have a TypeScript project, you can totally use JSI to create, for example, Python packages or Java packages, c -sharp packages, Golang packages, not too far in the future. So they are, they are working on this already. And what, what this is really about in the end is um, it's using the TypeScript type definitions to create an intermediate assembly file where all the types are contained in like an abstract format, which then is used by JSI to actually generate the well, the type bindings for the other languages, right? Um, so the way this works is that each of those packages for the target languages um, includes a JSI runtime, which is based on Node, so Node.js, so, which means even though you're using a Python or like a Java app in this case, um, you would still have to have uh, like a Node.js 
runtime on your machine, in your CI, wherever you want to run this in the end. Since that's like the runtime will actually execute and um, contain the logic where the Python classes or the Java classes are just you know, containing the interfaces and the type information and the delegating and proxying all the rest down to JSI runtime. Right. Okay. Yeah. It, which it's, makes, you know, which makes it not really, it's, it's not the fastest as you can imagine. Right. So it's like mm -hmm. the, the both processes are communicating via JSON. Um, and so I wouldn't write a game with that, but I think for creating infrastructure, it's perfectly fine. Well, uh, speaking about games, uh, I think Quake uh, now works uh, in the browser, Quake 3. <laughs> so <laughs> why not? And you can use yeah. WebAssembly for many things as well. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, uh, that's actually quite an interesting uh, thing which you just mentioned, because I didn't think about GSI, uh, how is it inside of process. So is it true that uh, like if we look from the user perspective, uh, just for myself, I want to understand how things are uh, connected together. So what I want to do, I want to manage some infrastructure and uh, I want to use my programming language. So I install, um, um, I, I install Terraform CDK uh, on my local machine. Then I create a project uh, by running uh, Terraform CDK or TF CDK in it uh, to create initial, <coughs> initial scaffold for the project. And then I start writing in my favorite programming language. Uh, then I run uh, Terraform uh, CDK to compile this or to execute this code. Um, and uh, at the end, I will have JSON code, which uh, is then going to be consumed uh, natively by Terraform, right? Exactly. Uh, so well, the tricky part here, which I didn't think uh, before you explained what is the GSII, is uh, how does con uh, convertation happens from my Python code into HCL or JSON? Uh, can you explain like what, what parts are involved into this? Because I think it's quite interesting to understand that uh, you are relying heavily on GSAII to do uh, cross-language interpretation, right? Yes. And uh, where exactly the, the magic happens? Like, okay, you, you use GSAI, <coughs> but how does GSAI knows about Terraform or Terraform uh, JSON files? How does it know that uh, this um, piece of code mm -hmm. should be converted into this JSON? Right. Um, <clears throat> so the, for example, if you, if you talk about the Python uh, package, or if you would write your infrastructure in Python, um, you would only have like, a, like essentially like a class with like a bunch of methods in there. Um, and where each of those methods would delegate to the JSI runtime, right? So there's not there's not any logic involved in, in your Python classes which are generated by JSI. The logic is still contained in in the Node.js files, so like in the uh, yeah the generate like the generated uh, Node.js files, and um, these were. Uh, these are the parts that you're actually executing and uh, trans transforming your infrastructure definitions into uh, like the JSON files in this case, right? So the, um, the Terraform JSON HCI compatible things. Mm -hmm. um, so this happens in, in Node.js and yeah, perhaps you can have a look later uh, how, how this would look like. So that's probably easier to, to see than to explain. Well, um, we'll so, but which see. means like you don't, you don't have to deal with any uh, interprocess communication. You don't have to be, uh, deal with the details. To just like what what we are what we are actually writing is like our business logic resides in TypeScript, and that's where like the transformation actually happens, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where we actually use um, use whatever you provided, and we just generate um, generate the JSON files. Right, so then, then the whole pipeline, if, if I can imagine, looks like Python code, GSAI, TypeScript logic, which understand how Terraform code should be generated, and then produce JSON uh, files. Yeah, right? exactly. Okay, so GSAI is a front uh, for the user. 
So G GSI, um, it's between... For the, for the user, it's transparent. Yeah. So the user do doesn't really necessarily know or have to, has to know that uh, JSI is involved. Um, so like for the user, you just install your Python package and this contains all you need. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So that's the point of GSI is that it, it, it's invisible, but it's doing uh, cross-language understanding in, or conversion to TypeScript, yes. which you guys process. I yeah. see. Cool. Uh, and that's actually explaining uh, why recently uh, there was a new edition. So now Java is supported uh, inside of uh, Terraform CDK. So when I found this yes. quite recently, I was like, oh my God, uh, will it be a lot of work for you guys to, to think about it? And now when you explain that you don't really care what kind of languages people use on front end, as, as long as you are working with uh, GSAI models, right? So they can use pretty much any language uh, on the front end. Is that right? That's, um, that's true. Like the, but our engineering effort is comparatively low as long as we stick to the languages which are supported at the moment in JSI. So which are really Python, C Sharp, Java, and as I said before, Golang will be added uh, not too far away. Um, so from that point of view, I think there's like currently there's an open pull request to add C sharp support and it's really not too big, yeah. the, the, the pull request, right? So it's like a very tiny and it's primarily adding like templates, which are used to bootstrap your project, mm -hmm. uh, when you create a new one. Um, and then there are like integration tests and stuff like this, right? Making sure this actually works end to end. So that's, uh, that's part of the process. And I think what's um, effort wise, um, it gets probably way more complex further down the road when it comes to supporting bug fixing, mm, you know, like when people have different target languages, different program ecosystems. Mm -hmm. um, and when, when they actually support all of these, then it's quite a, quite a bit of effort to trace down bugs and stuff like this, right? So like, I think in, the, in this case, um, well, it's certainly like way more effort compared to just, you know, support like one language, like TypeScript, mm -hmm. for example. Mm, but since it's like, it's, you know, like most of the bugs I would actually expect would probably be on the JSI side, which means it's like a joint effort between NOS, um, like our project and perhaps like, I don't know if there are other people involved, um, they might, um, you know, support this as well. So I think it's, yeah, you'll see, you see how, the, how that works out. Um, and I think that it's a moment. So when, at least when you look at the AWS CDK numbers and I think our numbers also like in a similar fashion that uh, the most popular libraries are TypeScript and Python, really by far the most popular ones. And then Java is, well, not not that popular. I think C Sharp is at the moment. Um, yeah, we don't support it at the moment, but it will be. And uh, I think AOS CDK is also not, not, I think it's like in place four. Yeah. From, from right. Languages. That's pretty interesting to know that languages are supported and uh, uh, GSAI is doing a good job, AWS is doing a good job. And uh, soon, well, I don't know how soon, but uh, I, I expect that in the near future there will be support for Rust as well, just because why not? And uh, yeah, well, <laughs> it's not on the roadmap, so yeah. I haven't seen that one. <laughs> well, I, I saw it in development uh, for quite some time, but now I can say that it's probably going to be released pretty soon. Uh, I'm not a big expert in Rust uh, at all, but I just see more and more projects are using it uh, inside of AWS and for different AWS specific things. So AWS uh, CDK for Rust, or not CDK, SDK for Rust, uh, will right. be available pretty soon. So then it means, right. mm, yeah. Yeah, I think that's actually the, the coverage which which the AWS CDK team is, uh, is aiming for is potentially supporting whatever the AWS uh, yeah. SDK is supporting, so yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, let's, uh, <coughs> so now, now we talked about languages and it's kind of cool and it's kind of uh, uh, first thing which people uh, have to experience. I mean, in order to be productive, they now need to know uh, at least one thing, which is programming language. 
So they don't need to know so much about Terraform internals and how to write HCL and what are limitations. But uh, uh, can you actually explain uh, what is feature parity between Terraform, HCL, and uh, this approach versus CDK approach? Because last time I looked into yeah. that CDK, well, and C uh, CDK itself as of today is 0.0.19. Which uh, indicate, which usually indicate, is it uh, is not quite there yet. So that's why I'm yes. uh, I'm really wondering about what is there, what kind of feature are supported, uh, like what kind of critical features are supported. Can I use it in production? So I think. <laughs> well, um, we do have users which are using it in production, um, but we don't recommend doing so. So it's an experimental project. Um, I mean, it's it, in the end, if you think about Terraform CDK, it's a layer on top Terraform, C, uh, Terraform itself, right? So mm -hmm. um, like what we can mess up is, you know, creating your configuration, um, but like the actual apply phase and plan phase are still going through the Terraform CUI. So from that regard, it's, you know, the, the risk is somewhat limited, but, um, I think what will be an issue potentially for users is that their like APIs will change, right? So there will likely be changes uh, and like more major changes before we move to to beta or even like you know further further than that. Um, so in terms of um, feature parity, we do support only. The, like a basic subset of what's possible with HCL, HCL 2.0 at the moment. Um, and I think most importantly, we're missing loops and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. um, so like the, the, the more dynamic features are not really supported. And I mean, when I talk about supported, what I mean is we don't really have proper abstractions for this, so which would make it easy to use these uh, as part of Terraform CDK. Um, we do have escape hatches, uh, which allow you to override any configuration which we are generating. Um, we, which was, or like, which is super useful since there were some, you know, like various issues, um, which would potentially block users and escape hatches uh, are a way to, to work around these. Um, it's not ideal, of course, right? So, in, Example, like I talked about loops, um, dynamic configuration. Um, we don't really have any abstractions for functions, intrinsic functions and stuff like this. Um, so which will be added, I think, to, well, over the next few months or so, I'm really sure there's not really any specific timeline at the moment. Mm. And I think, that's one way to look at it. And the other way to look at it is, well, we don't support uh, many of the features I just mentioned, um, but there are ways since you have like a, you know, like an input imperative programming language, you can work around these issues as part of your actual program logic, right? So you don't have loops, well, um, just, I don't know, it generates the resources as you need them basically. Well, that, that's Which what gets, we did before. That's what we used, uh, Jason, what was the name of the project even, Jason, 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 well, I forgot the name of the project because I didn't use it for quite some time. Uh, well, there are different solutions how we overcome these uh, uh, loops, features yeah. in resources and modules. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. So, um, so, so that's, that's, that's really one way. I mean, it, this becomes difficult when, when you talk about, you know, dynamic and computed resources and attributes and stuff. So then this will fall short since, you know, we can only generate configuration and it's long, we don't really have any access to, to the, well, to the main event of Terraform. So it's like difficult. You can't do anything. We can leverage things like the external provider, for example, you know, to, to somehow emulate data sources and uh, create custom data sources. Mm -hmm. um, you could, in theory, write your you know custom custom provider, custom resources, but that's really um, so. I'm experimenting with this here and there, uh, but that's nothing which will come anytime soon. Right. Uh, like as you know, as packaged with the Terraform CDK. Well, you mentioned escape hatches. 
so I understand the concept of escape, escape hatches as something what you can use if you want to get something done, but there is no built-in functionality to support it, right? So is it also right uh, to say that if there would be an escape hatch which allows me to pass all HCL as is from, let's say, start.tf into one of this uh, big, huge escape hatch, then Terraform CDK uh, is already a feature complete and uh, everything works out of the box. Um, I, I think, think you would have to convert it to JSON, to JSON first, um, but it could potentially work um, if it's JSON. Well, then problem solved. So <laughs> the whole project is now complete. Guys, everyone can use uh, Terraform CDK. It's ready for production immediately. Yeah. All features are supported. With that hack, certainly, uh, certainly possible, yes. E even, more, <laughs> even more features are supported. You can write uh, in any programming language. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a pretty good uh, solution. Because uh, the thing with escape hatches is something what I remember a long time ago. I read about Ansible, like, I don't know, five or how many years ago. But uh, I, I read about Ansible versus uh, shell script. And I clearly remember one of uh, point which was uh, indicated in documentation, which says that you already have a lot of shell scripts. And uh, here are all benefits of Ansible. So you can start using your shell script just by calling them from the Ansible. You don't have to rewrite all of logic of the, your shell script. So you can do this one by one migration uh, as time allows. And uh, since that time I remember that uh, I was looking for that concept implemented in many other places especially when it comes to migration and talking about migration mm -hmm. between tools is very complicated topic like I, I still have no clue how to implement uh, migration let's say when resource name has changed right mm -hmm. and uh, if I write one code today and then I want to rename it now I have to do Terraform state MV and do some magic. And if I use a project like Terraform CDK, which potentially should hide all of this complexity of Terraform for me, uh, what can I do for things like uh, rename? Do you have any plans or any solutions <coughs> how the migration path can be uh, programmed? Well, I mean, it you're talking about the migration from from existing Terraform HCL code to something like Terraform CDK. That's what you mean, um, or like are you talking about refactoring, refactoring. like your existing? Okay, more, more about refactoring. Um, yeah. yeah, refactoring is really interesting. Yes, um, since I think that's uh, that's one of the biggest issues which which are which lots of tools have in the infrastructure space, right? Yeah. So it's like it's a pain for uh, for cloud formation. It's um, they even really get any access to state at all, right? So um, it's that's really a pain. Um, and in the Terraform world, you still have access to the state usually. Um, and yeah, so like for Terraform CDK, it's like a bit like there's like another component which makes it um, like like a more pressing issue for us since at the moment. So I, I, I talked about Terraform CDK and the constructs, uh, aka resources, um, so which are built as a tree, and uh, the name is sort of automatically derived from the position in the tree mm -hmm. um, at the moment. So I'm not sure if you keep that schema, but the, the goal is that we have unique names uh, regardless of, mm -hmm. um, you know, like if you pull in for uh, like third party product or anything. Uh, so since we don't really have like the concept of namespacing, so at the moment yeah. it's really like unique resources in the tree, which means like when you move from, like one one construct or resource from one position to another position, yeah. uh, the name will change. You you can override the name and um, you know try well fix this manually, but it would certainly be way way better to to do this automatically. And so like there are like a few ideas. Uh, and I think the most interesting one is sort of like 
imitating what Git is doing to detect file changes, right? So if you move the file or if you, if you did something with that file <clears throat> and do something similar with the state um, or like the resource name, basically to try to detect if, that's, yeah. if this was moved or not. Um, so, so sorry to understand yes. uh, to understand it yeah. more clear. Uh, if I have Python code uh, and uh, I just uh, move one block uh, after another, so I swap, let's say, two blocks, well, they will have different names if I regenerate this code. No. Um, so what I mean is, um, so on <clears throat> when you when you think about this as a tree, like on the on the first level, your resource names will be essentially static. That's something which uh, got introduced recently. Mm. Um, so they won't be changed if you move them around. Um, but what I mean is, like each time you create a new class, like a new object, basically, which um, is like a new construct, like a new container for your resource. Um, this will be like a new node in the tree, and therefore, like if you move um a resource from like one container oh, right. to the other container right so like if you do like actual refactoring um on class level like when you create like uh, like extract like a resource to like a different class and then the, the resource name will usually change mm. oh, which uh, makes refactoring not really pleasant um so that's you know like moving one resource is fine but doing like really large scale refactorings is quite a pain and it's going to be explicitly a pain when you think about third-party packages, right? Mm -hmm. um, since when they start to refactor things um, on their end, you do an upgrade and you have to be very careful about, you know, like refactorings and putting in third-party um, third party yeah. plugins, which is true for the AWS CDK as well. So like, uh, it's like that, that's certainly a challenge which, which we have. Mm. Mm -hmm to make this more user friendly. Yeah, right. What, one of the solutions which uh, uh, we can do uh, or potentially can do, I didn't investigate it deeper, but we can write, uh, we can treat these files similar how we do with SQL migration. We have uh, certain commands in some, uh, some specific language where we can uh, say that in order to migrate from this version to that one, you need to rename this node into another node or uh, resource <clears throat> name. So exactly as we do with migration <coughs> in databases. And there are uh, some projects already, uh, one is called uh, TF Migrate, I think, uh, which, uh, okay. which uh, does similar things. So it has text file with, uh, uh, with uh, these statements. And then these statements will have to be executed, uh, I guess, before you run Terraform plan. So after you download code, Terraform right. init, and then you run this migration to update your state, <coughs> and then you plan it, and then plan should say uh, yeah. no changes. But uh, I agree that Actually, I mean, uh, it's not built in in any system, and well, we need to do something. It would be also. nice if, if Terraform CLI itself would support yeah. this, since I think that's a problem which which uh, like the entire Terraform ecosystem has. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the best case, this will be at some point implemented there. Um, and perhaps, I don't know, until then, we probably would, you know, implement like some, some stopgap yeah. solution uh, to, to make this a bit more pleasant. Yeah. Cool. Um, before we... Uh, ask you to share your screen and uh, show Terraform CDK in action because I'm honestly excited to see it's working. Uh, <laughs> I, I, could, I couldn't make it to work, guys, just between you and me. Uh, it failed on my computer because I have three versions of Python, uh, 3.9, 3.8, yeah. and uh, something is not really uh, well uh, polished somewhere. But I don't blame this project. I'm blaming more my Python setup, which is evolutioning as we speak. And, uh, <laughs> and one question uh, by, by the audience, where is it? Well, the question is, uh, Sebastian, what microphone do you use? I think it's quite uh, a relevant question for our talk. <laughs> Um, which microphone? Um, <laughs> at the moment, I'm just using the Bose uh, yeah, QuietComfort 35, the headset basically, so I don't have a, 
I do have a microphone here, but I'm not using it at the moment. Cool. Uh, if you, if anyone has any better questions, uh, or uh, sorry, not better, but more dedicated to Terraform <coughs> CDK, please don't hesitate to write it in any platform or any Twitch or YouTube uh, where you're watching this, and uh, we'll be glad to uh, bring it. So um, uh, let's look into TFCDK in action. Can you please share your screen and uh, show how this uh, yeah. thing work? Hang on. I will try to put you correctly in the screen. I cannot promise, but uh, well, here is it. If I click this button, wow, oh my God, amazing. It works. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, let's uh, just start with an empty, empty project. Um, so there's nothing really in this folder here. And I do have like the, like pretty much the latest version, which we have um, installed as a CRI. And so usually the first step is you're going to init your, your project and oops. So there, I'm just looking if 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 we do list the templates here. I don't think so. Okay. Um, anyway, so we do support like a bunch of templates um, for the various languages. So like for TypeScript, for Python, for for Java. Um, I'm going to use a TypeScript template and uh, just going to to init this. So it will take me through like a little dialogue. And yes, let's, let's just call it intro. You just go go with the defaults. So it's it's detecting that I do use a Terraform Cloud token, and therefore it's suggesting to to use uh, TypeScript. No, let's call it intro live. So it's just taking me to like this little dialogue, and then it's you know executing the template which we. Um, which we see in a second. So it's going to install the de dependencies. <clears throat> and so, and I think this template actually contains a configuration which generates the TypeScript bindings for, for the AWS provider. It's not very so often. This, that's what we are... Sorry, it's not very often mm -hmm. when uh, we can see found zero vulnerabilities. What did you do? <laughs> <laughs> um, we probably did upgrade our dependencies. I'm not sure, but yeah, it's like uh, I think it's usually installing like a bunch of dependencies. Uh, oh, it's yeah. actually not not too bad. Uh, <clears throat> so what what you see here is um, that we we have two ways to to use provider bindings at the moment. Um, so we pre-publish um, like a, the, the most popular providers as npm packages. So what what I just said is that part of this template is cdktf get, um, which is a process or like a command to um, to to take the Terraform provider JSON specification and generate TypeScript classes out of that, which is what we see here, right? So this uh, .gen folder was generated by the cdktf get command, and this essentially mirrors like the Terraform resources and for each Terraform resource in the AWS provider, we do have one TypeScript file here. And when we look into this, this is entirely auto-generated and um, is actually the code which is, which is used for, even if you would use, um, you know, like uh, Python or anything. So you would still use these TypeScript files behind the scenes, right? Um, so, and so that you don't have to do this all the time, we do publish like the pre-packaged providers here. Uh, so if you if you're keen to use them, so it's like it saves you like a bit of work and uh, it's usually uh, way easier. In particular, if you want to build dependencies on you know on the provider stuff. So if you want to abstract it like a bit more. But anyway, so this is the um, the, the product which you see here. Um, oh, there's like a bit of indentation issues which you might want to fix. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> that's the, the configuration file which we used for um, 
you know, like as information for our uh, processing, like the generation part, like which target language do we do we want to support, uh, which command do we want to synthesize, like from TypeScript to to Terraform JSON, and in which providers or modules do we want to build? Right. So we do support modules to some extent. At the moment, only via the Terraform registry. Um, but I think the support will be extended, you know, like to to other modules which be which could be used in Terraform, like might it be local or from GitHub or whatnot. Um, right, and so this is usually then the like your like you know like usually you have an like an app like the different um, routings here. So we have like an app as a like the, the main container, and then in each app you could potentially have multiple stacks. And at the moment, we only support one stack, but uh, we are sort of well, pursuing the direction of multiple stacks um, in the future, which will likely go in a similar direction as Terragrant, right? So that you have like each stack would result in its own state, basically. Um, but yeah, at the moment, it's only one. And we do have the backend configuration here. So I don't know, what do you, let's perhaps, yeah, so the code which uh, was generated uh, was from example, right? So it, uh, it's this, um, the Terraform provider. Yeah, so all of this information, which, uh, yeah, I mean, th this code is great. I mean, honestly, I, I like to use something like this because now I have autocomplete. And for people who uh, still use VS Code and uh, every day they are asking like, hey, why there is no official plugin for Terraform? Well, guys, if you write in TypeScript, actually... yeah, but it doesn't have auto-completion. <laughs> I think they, they did provide, I, I, honestly, I haven't tried it, but I <coughs> but I think there's a language server for Terraform. Yeah, but it's... It uh, should, should it, yeah, I mean, Radic is, Radic is actively working on it, but uh, it's still not there yet. Okay. Uh, so yeah, uh, if if anyone wants to have auto completion, you can write it using Terraform CDK, and uh, this dot gen provider AWS has pretty decent uh, auto completion features. I'm sure. Yeah, uh, that's that's so pretty cool. Exactly so. Yeah, that's so that's, that's uh, cool. basically what you what you get here. Like uh, you know, like um, I don't know. Um, so. We like one of the challenge we have is that unfortunately the Terraform provider spec um, does not really contain any information, um, or at least this, that's really depending on the provider you're using. And for the AWS provider, at least it's it's not containing any information uh, documentation-wise, right? So that since the documentation of the provider is disconnected from the actual source code, yeah. Um, so which so it would be nice to have. You know, like more interf uh, like more information uh, below the class here. Yeah, it it is um, common. It's definitely common, and uh, there are a few projects working on it right now, um, by uh, Brian Flad, for example. So yeah, uh, it's definitely coming quite soon. Uh, what what uh, you can do here, or can you maybe show us? Uh, well, you're already doing this. I don't have to to ask you. <laughs> Just show us in action. So. <laughs> Exactly. So this is here, um, like <clears throat> the way I would um, create, like you know, like any resource. Um, and so you get the auto completion here, of course. Yes. <clears throat> uh, what you still have to pull in is the AWS provider itself. So we don't add this uh, automatically at the moment. Um, so I'm not sure. I mean, we could in theory auto detect that you know that you're using you're using resources. <clears throat> from AWS provider and then you know just add this provider, but I think usually you want to configure this provider anyway to some extent at least. Um, and yeah, so in this is like like a pretty minimal configuration which would you know provision like an S3 bucket uh, in the uh, in Frankfurt basically in the Frankfurt region here in Germany. Um, and it's using the remote state backend from the Terraform cloud, right? Um, this here is actually the command which actually synthesizes them, like which takes this entire configuration and synthesizes everything which is part of the app as JSON files. Um, so 
I did run this before I added any infrastructure, I think. Yeah, exactly. So this is like the like a like a blank file, basically, right? So we provide some metadata, we provide the backend here. Um, but that's the bare minimum here, which which you get if your stack is entirely empty. If you run it again, um, so we see okay, hey, it's synthesizing. So it's taking the TypeScript configuration and um, is creating JSON out of this. And by the so way, my while, while, is it's, while it's unloaded. synthesizing, is it possible to see what's going on? Like, uh, okay, is it possible to see uh, like execution flow or what kind of uh, dependencies were included into this? Because uh, now I can see only a result file. Right. Exactly. So at the moment, we are not interacting with anything. Uh, we can do like a like a plan. Yeah, we can mm. do this in a second. Yes. Um, so, and you know, you see, we added a provider. We added a resource. So this is like mapping one to one, uh, mostly. Um, <coughs> so we do have like a bit, a bit of meta information, which uh, will be useful for error handling and you know mapping errors back to where they actually happened and stuff like this. But that's usually not really important to the end user. Um, in the best case scenario, at least. Um, so yes, and if we if we would run this, um, yeah, let's just do it that way. Let's just run a diff. So, so the naming for these commands were mostly inherited from the AWS CDK. So that's why they are not really matching the Terraform commands. So diff is equal is equals uh, or equals to a plan in Terraform. Um, so I'm not sure like which which direction this will go in the future. Uh, if this will be more aligned with Terraform or if it's staying more in the uh, in the world of CDK, you'll see. Um, and so yeah, so what this is actually doing, so like the, the different steps here is so like the CDK tf.out folder is our execution uh, directory. Um, and you see here it did download and it did init the Terraform workspace here and um, is running the commands as part, like, you know, part of this folder here. We don't really have a state file since we're using Terraform Cloud, but in theory, if you would use local state, the state file would be part of your root project directory. So it wouldn't be here in this folder since by definition, the cdktf.out uh, is a throwaway thing, right? So you just um, can remove it and uh, run your cdktf diff or deploy or, or send or what, whatnot. And it will always be recreated in in the exact uh, same way. And yeah, so what we what we do have now is like a very condensed diff. So we don't show really the details here. Um, but since in the end we are just using Terraform, you should be able to do pretty much the same in the CDKT of out folder, and it should you know be still usable in the same way as, as before, which is also like quite good since, uh, yeah. but it, it would work if I would yeah. do this. <clears throat> um, so, you know, like in, in case there are like some edge cases or in case, I think in particular as a condensed div is an issue um, when you have like, a, you know, like larger existing infrastructure, you usually want to see what you changed uh, or what you would change in detail. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so, but in the end, you can still fall back to the Terraform plan command. Yeah. And that's what people also use for environments like CI and stuff sometimes, right? So where they yeah. just essentially ship the, the JSON configuration and say, well, okay, and then just, um, you know, use Terraform client to, to deploy the stuff. But you can still use it like CDKTF itself. It's totally capable to be used in automated environments. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you, since you cannot use uh, CDK TF and you cannot run anything else on, let's say, uh, Terraform Cloud, you will need to compile yes. it, compile it into this uh, JSON file, and then commit this JSON file. Yeah. Well, we, we are working on. Um, there's also an open pull request for Terraform Cloud support, which would <coughs> leave out the Terraform CI entirely, um, and. So this would be one way to use Terraform Cloud, but I think it's very desirable to have like a you know like a tight integration into Terraform Cloud. Um, so 
yeah, we will see how that will end up, but um, I would expect this to happen at some point. Yeah, right. Well, natively Terraform CDK, uh, oh, not natively, sorry, but uh, initially Terraform CDK was designed for developers who like programming language, right? So yes. um, they probably will have to write this in, inside of the VS Code editor and, uh, well, how it's generated into Terraform, into HCL or into JSON, they should not really care so much. Uh, no, if, if, you know, if, if we are successful actually abstracting it good enough, uh, well enough, then yes, it shouldn't really matter to the user, um, you know, like the nitty gritty details. Um, so, yeah. And yeah. That, that's my main question here is when you create this, let's say S3 bucket, you included a few mm -hmm. things here and there, which was pretty straightforward. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, you didn't use uh, Terraform as such. But what if I want to use, let's say, can you update this code to give, uh, let's say, uh, a random name to the bucket? For that one, you need to use a random provider. So you need to uh, get a random provider or random path name and put this name into bucket name, right? Uh, I mean, you could, uh, you could have something like, well, uh, or like uh, probably usually, yeah, Probably the, the way you, like, I think there's a Terraform or like the Terraform CDK would be, um, well, you could usually go and get an interface, let's say called foo, uh, bucket, or she is pretty, uh, so what I want to see is how this code will be updated if I want to create two resources. One is random path and another one is S3 bucket. And the name of this S3 bucket is uh, not provided by the user, but it's actually created by Terraform as well. So how can you pass- uh, By how, Terraform itself. Yeah, how can you pass reference- Ter by, Terraform, by Terraform, ah, yeah, I see, I see, I see, I see. So, <laughs> so what you would want, you, you're talking about two buckets or? Yeah, so one bucket and another one is called, uh, let's say random path resource to get a random name. Ah, uh, now I see. Uh, so where's like, is like the, the random, uh, random is a provider, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's give it a try. Um, let's just say yeah, we modern, do have modern the random two. provider here. Yeah, it's the same version, um, more than two, two point zero. Ah, okay. I think it should it should take latest uh, if it's not yeah, specified it's, here. Yeah, um, it will work as well. So. So that uh, th that's the whole point of Terraform is that we connect a lot of resources and we'll let Terraform to handle that for us. So we create a mm. bucket and the name of the bucket pass to another resource and so on. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what we would do here, so like this um, get command is now has created like two folders here, right? So we do have the random resource um, and we likely need the random provider then. Provider random. Uh, yeah. I like this autocomplete very much. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, this can be quite helpful. Yes. Yeah, that's why I'm using IntelliJ. Ah, IntelliJ. Yeah. So how's the Terraform support there in IntelliJ? It was awesome since day zero. Actually. It helped okay. me. It helped me use HCL two before. Um, well, not before, but during first week of uh, Terraform zero twelve was released. So it had full support. So shuffle or Pet. which resource Pet. are we talking about? Pet. Pet. Yeah, this one. So, 
So, is there anything? No, no nothing. So it's not, not not any arguments. Okay, perfect. So we don't need that. Um, so what we just do here would be something like this, then, right? Yeah. <clears throat> ID. We use the ID here. We don't need the bucket name. Uh, probably don't need this here. And so if you then synthesize this, <coughs> or like do a diff, um, yeah, then it should reference the resource. And we can double check this here in the CDKTF out. Um, well, no, there is a question. So this is. There is a question uh, while it's synthesizing. I think you can take this question. Is there a way to use yeah. uh, TFCDK with custom providers? Um, like as in like from from disk, for example, or I guess uh, mm, I guess it has to be published at least in the registry. Oh yeah, like whatever support in the registry is totally uh, totally uh, doable. So since the only the only interface we actually support at the moment is whatever comes from the registry, like it might be a module, it might be a provider. Uh, you can always generate your um, your provider bindings from from there. But I who think should we... this? who should generate this dot again providers and push it to npm. Should it also happen? No, no. Uh, so who should uh, so as long as content. Um, so the the usual workflow would be, um, I, I think, the easiest and probably the most straightforward approach would be to actually commit these generated providers um, to your, you know, to, like as part of your Git repository or whatever you're using. So and then you would also recognize any like significant changes to this. Um, like the alternative would be, of course, that you run the CDKTF get step all the time. You, mm -hmm. You're going to use this, which is quite time consuming and unnecessary in the end. Um, and well, what we did with the popular providers, um, and there we were just looking at download numbers from the registry, uh, was like publishing them as NPM packages, right? So and uh, potentially Python or Java or whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. Um, and you could do the same, of course, right? So you could totally go ahead and publish your own providers and um, distribute them via your dependency management um, tooling which you're using. Um, totally possible. But we, at the moment, we only support the, the most popular ones. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so this would create something. And if we look here, um, yeah, so this will just, you know, uh, reference it accordingly as you would expect it to be. And this works quite, quite well, which um, it gets like a bit more complex and difficult, you know, if you have like lists of things, uh, we do support this, um, you know, like if you, if you had like an attribute, which is a list, um, a computed attribute, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, like the more dynamic use cases are at the moment not out of the box supported. But again, like the like the override thing which we talked about the SK patches, um, you know, is usually just mm -hmm. the path to the attribute and whatever value you want to provide there. So and this works on resource level and on stack level. So you can do pretty much whatever you want. Right. Well, yeah, this looks pretty good. I can imagine that complexity, which we now put into uh, TF files, we can express into a programming language, which, which is good. But as you said, that not all features are supported. Uh, so which means that we will have to use escape, ha escape hatch quite frequently if we, if we want to, let's say, use uh, different Terraform uh, functions as well, right? So that uh, yeah, sure. Like if you would want to, I don't know, uh, I don't know, get an element or something from from a map or so, so <coughs> or I don't know, some other 
yeah, some other functions which which are then you would have to use the ASK patch, yes. Yeah. Um it's it's Google. Um it sometimes looks a bit weird since there's lots of escaping involved. Um but yeah, other than that it's it's okay. But yeah, um that's that's certainly something which will be worked on and yeah, I'm quite but I'm looking forward to to, to the next year. So I think there's yeah. lots lots of lots of lots of things will happen in, in that space. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to uh, to another thing, which is uh, Pulume. Well, <laughs> uh, yes. so far, everything what I see on this 32 lines can be expressed in very similar way in Pulume. Right. Mm -hmm. Have you uh, looked into differences? Like, I guess Pulume has uh, evolved and used very similar approach for many things, right? Except that they don't use uh, CDK for that because they predate CDK. Yeah. So, uh, uh, what what are the things which you think is really differentiating? Because I'm asking this question for two reasons. First reason is that I have no clue what is difference. And uh, mm -hmm. second is that I have asked this question Pulume already, but I have not asked you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, let me answer and then I would be curious what they say. Um, <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so like, first of all, like, I think the, the execution mode. Um, so, I haven't really looked in detail at Pulumi, but so from what I understand, what Pulumi is doing is they they essentially rewrote the Terraform CI, like the Terraform Core engine. Um, you know, built up, built their own thing, and so rather than generating configuration and executing this um, as a, like, a, on, like on different levels, they do have a tighter integration into the actual main event loop of what's happening, um, and which allows them to do like a few. Uh, like more dynamic approaches than what we can support at the moment in the terms in the term CDK context, right? So I think there's some lazy evaluation involved and in, in, on there and and um, yeah, so we can't really do this. So it's like here's a really clear distinction between the Terraform Core Engine and the Terraform CDK, mm -hmm. uh, which are talking through the Terraform configuration itself. Yeah. So it's that's, that's one main distinction between the the two projects, and then the other one is virtually already mentioned. So they they're not using CDK, therefore they're not using JSI, which is responsible for the polydot libraries in the CDK world. Um, and the good part about something like JSI is that it's really, as I mentioned before, it's not really tied to the CDK core project itself. So, but it also applies to abstractions you would write, right? If you would want to write your own, I don't know, platform as a service, whatever, uh, you know, like as, as multiple packages, um, you could write them in TypeScript and automatically transpile them into all the different languages, basically, right? So you don't have to write it multiple times, uh, but you would write it once in TypeScript and then distribute it to whatever the JSI supports. Um, and from what I understand, at least um, for Pulumi, you would have to pick a pick a target platform, right? So you either write your abstractions in in TypeScript, in I don't know, Java, in Golang, whatever they support. Um, so I think that's yeah, also like a different philosophy, I guess. Um, yeah. Besides from that, um, sure, the core concepts are. Or like the core ideas are like I think similar. Um, yeah. Well, one one thing which uh, which I think is uh, is um, is really important to understand is where you spend most of uh, efforts. Currently, you you mentioned that you have not uh, been able, to, uh, or you have not implemented. I mean, it's doable, of course, but you just have not finished uh, support for. Uh, complex things like, uh, uh, well, uh, Terraform modules, uh, e iteration loops, and other things which are pretty artificial, I would say, in, H in HCL. I mean, they, mm -hmm. to, to my mind, they don't belong there in first place. But they are there because people couldn't live without them. 
but uh, <laughs> it's kind of uh, like uh, if anyone would ever ask me, I wouldn't put them there in first place. Uh, I would definitely use different things closer to uh, uh, approach what Pulumi is doing. The difference between mm. uh, this approach and Pulumi is that they don't focus on uh, crazy complicated things like HCL iteration and uh, and limitations of HCL are not uh, are not there. That's why they don't have yeah, to, exactly. to compile from programming language into uh, restricted environments like HCL and then execute this. They can just skip the whole HCL uh, or TF or JSON compilation part completely and uh, talk to... Yeah, to that's, that's probably why they, rewrote, why they rewrote the engine, right? So since mm -hmm. they do want it to, to uh, well, get, get away from HCL as an... Yeah. You know, as an intermediate artifact, which uh, is sometimes perhaps not necessary. Yes. Yeah. And I know I wouldn't be surprised if you know if, if there was a tight integration at some point um, between Terraform CI and um, uh, Terraform CDK. However, I think what's what's important to understand is like 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 one of the primary goals, not only for or like let's talk about AOS first. Um, like AWS CDK, like the major efforts which they did in, in the past, like, I don't know, one or two years is like, besides from building all the core components here is really providing lots of abstractions, you know, which are sort of like, okay, hey, that's how we would suggest doing this basically, right? So like as AWS, we suggest you to, I don't know, handle like an EKS cluster or like a Fargate service that way. So to create like patterns and um, I, would be pretty um, pretty happy if we could leverage these you know abstractions in Terraform CDK as well. Um, and like from that point of view, it makes sort of sense to stay on the um, on the configuration level um, since it's way easier to transport or like transpose configuration when compared to actually well you know like uh, I think it's easier to to, to make this work in a way as it's working right now. And I think this would be like the goal there is essentially to have like a, some sort of standard library for uh, AWS services, which are mainly driven by AWS, but supported by Telcom as well. Um, well, that's a dream. And that's the, a dream, honestly. For me, that's a dream. That's a dream, yes. Uh, <laughs> that's a dream. If, uh, anyone, if I, anyone from uh, AWS is watching this, please uh, do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that's um, that's something which. So I, I'm not sure if it will if, if it will happen, but I would love to see it happen, and uh, that's what I'm trying to uh, you know to to, um, to work for basically that this will happen. That's like one way or the other. Um, but like you know, ignoring AWS, I think this is also like a huge opportunity for like for for other contexts, like thinking about Azure in particular, for example. Um, so, you know, there are like similar concepts involved, the Azure Resource Manager, um, there's a telephone provider, and it's like, well, not too different from the from the relationship between Telform and um, AWS CDK. So it could be something in the same direction, right? So, and I think this would be really, really, really fantastic if this wouldn't really be kept in the AWS world only, uh, but also, you know, like would grow beyond that to, to more cloud providers. And as you said before, I mean, there is like a, like a first baby step towards this direction um, with like some Azure, Azure um, CDK, which is not official and it's, you know, it's like, uh, it's really a rough prototype and um, yeah, but perhaps, perhaps there will be more, um, more effort in this direction. Yeah. Well, uh, it's quite interesting to uh, talk to you about um, different formats. And uh, since we now mentioned Pulumi and uh, that they wanted to get rid of HCL and implement it in programming languages, uh, in, uh, in, in this, uh, like in spirit of this one, uh, why do you think that this approach is better in first place? Like, wh why do you believe in using programming language is better than using Terraform HCL? <coughs> I mean, this uh, 33 um, I think, lines... I think, I think, yeah? 
this uh, 33 lines which you have uh, on your screen right now is uh, oh, similar yeah. similar to uh, what uh, we can write in HCL. And I gotcha. guess HCL is uh, quite readable as well. I mean, yeah, totally. Point. I think uh, like for, for the simple, for the simple uh, use cases, um, it it doesn't really uh, it's it's probably more complexity than you would need if you, you know in comparison to just writing like a bit of HCL. I think the the use cases uh, which which I have in mind at least are like the more complex ones. Um, so thinking about like the product I was working for like before I started doing the Telnet CDK involved going from on-premise to AWS. It was like about 30, 30 services, which had to be moved uh, from traditional infrastructure to like a more container-based approach, different product teams involved, um, which uh, sort of do as, as part of this project, you know, like we're sort of expected to to take ownership on, on their own infrastructure as well, uh, to some extent. There was a central platform team. And I think in, in these scenarios where it's like, it's not only about actually creating infrastructure, but making it uh, actually reusable, distributable, uh, you know, easy to maintain mm -hmm. um, and actually allow the product teams to stay in an ecosystem, uh, like a you know, tooling wise, programming language wise, um, which they are sort of familiar with, right? So, and I think that's really like the, the major pushbacks we had from product teams were really about, okay, sure, it's Terraform, HCL, it's not, it's not too complicated, but in the end, it's something I don't really want to think about. Um, and I think what, when I left, what they ended up doing was, uh, I think they created like, you know, like they wrote their own CI and created their, their essentially like a, like a small version of Terraform CDK. That's what they more or less did, right? Um, I think for for use cases like this is uh, this like complex distribution uh, cases this is quite interesting. Plus, um, when you think about less about the traditional infrastructure uh, in terms of you know VMs and stuff, but more about the serverless uh, use cases, um, where business logic and infrastructure is actually more and more melting together. Um, I think in these cases, it becomes pretty, pretty neat, right? So, so where you can essentially just stay in TypeScript all the time and uh, make it happen behind the scenes that the function you just wrote will just be packed as a Lambda function uh, in AWS and you know, shipped, shipped to AWS, basically. Yeah, so this okay. works. Uh, so this this works in. This would work in a setting like Terraform CDK or AWS CDK. This works for Pulumi, I think, um, but it's it's probably hard to do this in an HCL only world. So, and I think these cases are the more interesting ones. Well, yeah, I absolutely agree with uh, with uh, serverless um, uh, like serverless approach. Is that yes, I would like to to not jump between different technologies for serverless. And uh, well, uh, that's exactly why I like to look at uh, separation of this complexity and uh, expose modules always. So yes, uh, for example, to manage uh, serverless resources, it's complicated. It's like thousands of line of HCL with uh, external providers, null resources, um, yeah. bunch of different magic but users of the module they don't know what is inside they just consume and they say this is source where my application is and please build it as python application that's it <coughs> uh, then inside of yeah. that is thousands of lines in python code and uh, several thousands of hcl code a lot of magic but it works and uh, yeah. th that's something what i uh, still use and i'm uh, I'm trying to figure out if this approach will uh, will be effective in long run. And for Terraform, so, so using yeah. Terraform is fine for this case because users of this module, they don't know internals. They just expose to three, five parameters. 
So you're talking about this uh, Sotoless.tf uh, uh, yeah. project? Or? Yeah, Sotoless.tf yeah. and uh, specifically uh, Terraform AWS modules uh, for Lambda, which uh, yeah. suddenly yeah, got, right. got more <clears throat> attention than I expected. So every morning I wake up and I check my email and there are like four or five people asking specifically about this module, which is pretty cool. So people ask, uh, yeah. people fix different issues. Uh, we add uh, some uh, new functionality like container support was added uh, pretty much uh, during a few days after uh, the, the release uh, last week. And in general, uh, people are consuming that one without understanding what is inside. Similar how you wish people to consume, like in this case, uh, let's say providers random or providers AWS, they don't know that .gen providers folder was automatically generated and is containing thousands of lines and people people just use yeah sure it. exactly and in the best case they would just use this right so yeah. uh so this would be the npm package and then you don't have to deal with the uh, generated files anyway yeah right so um, yeah. yeah sure that's uh, that's that's true um and and i think it's always yeah, like uh, you know different different approaches to the to the same problem so which is which is good i think and um yeah so in the end i think it's really about staying uh, like using what the people are comfortable with right um well so uh, I, I kind of disagree with this one because uh, people will i mean if, if you don't give uh, people uh, options and you don't explain them that this option is better because of this and this and this people will write terraform in yaml i mean i can show you how to do this i mean you write it in you write it in yaml use uh, yaml anchors uh, then you use uh, jinja to uh, to add um, loops and so on then you compile it from yaml into json and then you consume the <laughs> json using terraform i, I did it uh, three or four years ago and it, it was okay but uh, well n it felt that uh, it was a little bit too complicated and the same happens with other technologies like if you show to people that hey this solution is fine but there are also 10 other solutions please go and pick uh, one for you people will pick up uh, something what they think think is good but in many cases uh, they need to have a little bit more information to make a proper decision it's like when people ask me like how long time will it take i have no clue how long time will it take <laughs> Yeah, but what I mean is about not not everyone uh, wants to make this decision. That's usually where you know those central architecture teams or I don't know ops teams or whatever come come into the play, right? So they sort of provide guidelines and say, okay, hey, here's this wide uh, wide variety of tools, and we condense it down to the selection basically and. I mean, like when, when I think about the prior project, I mean, we, we were using multiple tools. We were using Telegram, we were using Terraform, we were using a serverless framework in some cases. Um, so, and, this, but this depends, depended really on the team. Um, and in the end, whatever floats, floats about for the team, right? So, and sure, there will be mistakes. There will be dead ends probably here and there, but I don't know, it's, I it's, think it's anyway. It, it is long. If you want to, enjoy, to go. they have to be. They have to be. You know, have to enjoy some freedom. So, otherwise, it's it's gonna be. Yeah. Well, always, always the same thing, and that's probably also, also yeah. an issue if you just have like one, like you know, every 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 problem looks like a nail. Uh, so it's. Well, of course, then we have yeah. to use Terraform for that. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's what my approach. <laughs> well, okay, cool. Uh, well, let's move on. I have a few things uh, which I, I really want to ask you, and uh, uh, yeah. I need I need your uh, well your, your feedback on that. So uh, yeah. you, you've been working on Terraform CDK for quite a long time, and uh, I, I'm wondering what was the most uh, frequent question or request which you've heard from people. Uh, when they approach you and they say like, oh, we want to use this tool, but we need support for, I don't know, ARM. <laughs> or what was the strangest or frequent <clears throat> things which you've heard? 
Well, <clears throat> there, were this, uh, there were requests to, to generate HCL, um, so which we don't support at the moment. Um, and I think people were sort of trying to use it then as a template engine, more or less. Um, mm. And I, I think it's not, not well, technically there's not, nothing, nothing wrong with that. Um, it's just not really on the top of our priority list at the moment. So uh, like other things which, which people are asking for is like this, you know, this um, Terragon workflow, like Terragon style workflow with multiple stacks. And I think that's, that's probably one of the features that will come in the near future. Um, and well, what people were not really asking for, but what I think will make a difference is um, are like, you know, like abstractions. Um, so like when we, what we are seeing here are like the generated resources. Um, and so in, in CDK speak, that's the level one uh, resource. And then the next level would be like level two, right? So if you would take those resources and create our own class out of this and say, okay, this is like sort of like a module in Terraform. Um, and then, you know, prepackage this as a provider, basically like for, for Azure or anything like this, uh, Azure, Oracle, Google, uh, you name it in the end. Um, but that's a tremendous effort. To, to actually provide proper uh, proper abstractions for, for these providers. Um, but this would make it actually so much better to use, right? So mm -hmm. since I think this is where really the, the magic will happen. So it's like, uh, that this is what AWS CDK is doing. And um, that's, well, that's a really long shot, uh, but I really hope we will get there. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's one of the best thing which, uh can be implemented is that you apply your knowledge of platform and wrap it as a level two, three, four, I don't know what's name, what's number yeah. of uh, the definition, but probably the highest, the better, like level four, five <laughs> uh, is definitely better than level one, two. Uh, the point is that uh, a lot of people, and uh, I'm speaking uh, on behalf of many of my customers, have no clue what mm. is actually AWS infrastructure or how it's supposed to be built. Like, what is the difference between subnet? Uh, like, yeah. uh, why is it better to use this one versus another one? And so on. So many, many uh, questions can be eliminated if you just tell to people that, hey, this is already a um, good enough solution which you can use and um, it, will, it will help you to to do what you wanted so in pulumi they started this early on and their product i think is called crosswalk uh, in, in for aws where they uh, abstract uh, this uh, with higher level constructs and uh, people are using it uh, quite effectively yeah. um well I mean, yeah, that's something no, this, this year would be, yeah. this year would be uh, basically like the level two uh, resource, right? Mm -hmm. So which which would be mimic the AWS interface, right? So you have a bucket, uh, and we are assuming here we would have a Lambda function somehow defined here as a resource, and you just you know grant it uh, grant the Lambda function read uh, writes for for this bucket, right? So like yeah. a very simple simple example, but uh, you know this is this is these are the details you don't want to care about usually uh, you don't want to want to have the policy in place uh, make it least privilege access and stuff like this so this is this will be all handled by by functions like this mm -hmm. and, and you can you know, abstract this further uh, to load balancers and api gateways and stuff so but that you actually have your object oriented interfaces um, to connect the different pieces of your infrastructure uh, in an actual expressive way and um and i think that's that's where it gets interesting mm. yeah absolutely and uh, i know that uh, aws uh, sdk they have uh, even website uh, sdk constructs or something like that where they publish uh, these high level constructs and they're pretty helpful i'm like if yeah. i would use uh, aws uh, sdk i'm sure that i would be able to compose my infrastructure from those constructs and uh, it would be much better result in short amount of time. 
So that's uh, definitely yeah. that's something what I personally believed uh, into Terraform modules from day one, is that there will be some uh, uh, concept uh, of Terraform module which is verified, which is uh, uh, like uh, implementing different different uh, strategies, and people use it and don't go inside of it. That's what I try to do with many of my modules uh, nowadays. Uh, but yeah. still a little bit more opinionated stuff which hides this for user is really, really important. And uh, I think yeah. uh, I think we can talk about this for a very long time where things has to, has to go. Uh, I, I really like uh, the way how you approach this project with really uh, like uh, dedication that uh, you work on uh you you try to solve real people problem uh and again showed 32 lines of code is not so impressive but i clearly understand where things can go and uh, if we are talking about um, high level structures and if you let's say implement it uh i mean not just you but if uh, the whole community understand that this is the way to go then i'm sure that this project will be extremely useful yeah, I hope so, yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> and uh, you mentioned that uh, some people wanted to generate HCL. Well, they can convert from HCL to JSON or from JSON to HCL quite natively. Yeah, I guess so. <coughs> I, haven't, so. I haven't tried it, but yeah, it should be... Well, it works. Be, sure. It yeah, works yeah. with I, some exceptions. Some of the edge cases, yeah, exactly. The, the, like a few edge cases from going from JSON to HCL. The mm -hmm. other way around, from HCL to JSON, is fine. Um, but yeah, I think for the other way, you need some schema information at some point. So, but yeah, edge cases. Yeah, yeah. There but are I haven't some, tried it. Some edge cases, and uh, I don't think there is any project in open source which is doing it uh, quite effectively. Like there are still uh, exceptions here and there, so we'll see, we'll see. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, well, I have just a few questions uh, for you before we wrap up. It's already a very long episode. Um, and I know that some people <laughs> say like, oh, it's too long time, we cannot take so long break. Well, guys, you can take three breaks today to watch just one episode. So, um, uh, briefly, uh, what are you working on right now in this project, uh, like feature one, two, three? <coughs> so it's one. like um, it's at the moment it's Tough and Cloud and C Sharp uh, both in parallel. Um, other than that, it's yeah, it's gonna be well, it's like it, it's not really defined yet. Uh, as I said, there will be like likely multiple stack support this will likely come then i think like in general like more getting more feature complete uh, in terms of abstractions and you know like guidelines for the user um but yeah i think like at the moment there's not really like like this proper roadmap um but i would expect that this will happen um, for 2021 so right. for the next year um i think there will be like a much much clearer uh, view and like for the path forward so right and as you mentioned uh, this is uh, i mean for, for those who don't know this is experimental project don't expect it to be yeah. uh, finished by certain date uh, with certain amount of features right i mean uh, it's experimental and uh, as usually with open source is that community can open an issue and say like it's awesome project and I would love to use this project for project X, but I'm missing this and this feature. And uh, well, if exactly. you can... that's the case for, for the experimental project, right? So, like getting user feedback, that was a primary concern for us, like getting feedback. Yeah, and I, I, I think that one type of feedback which you would really appreciate is that more people opening issues or approaching you in any other ways and say that, uh, oh, this is awesome things. Uh, because we would like to have this and this problem solved. Like all kind of use cases would definitely help you to prioritize different things. And even what you mentioned today, uh, like when I'm thinking about this for a very brief amount of time, it seems to me that 
uh, it's like if you finish it and like if everything goes fine, then it will be a really awesome project. Uh, but before that, I cannot tell, let's say, to anyone uh, from my surroundings that, hey guys, drop HCL completely and this is the way to do. Because, uh, well, I, I would rather say drop Terragram completely uh, than uh, drop HCL. Uh, um, yeah, it's um, you have to be adventurous and uh, <laughs> you know willing to, willing to the report box uh, at least, and you know like be comfortable with uh, when things go like a bit off the rails um, if you use it at the moment, right? So that's that's part of the deal at the moment. Um, but yeah, I mean, sure, like uh, that's certainly not a state we want to stay in for too long time right so it's yeah, yeah. there's not really any timeline at the moment yeah and that's a kind of a, a relevant question like my next relevant question to this is uh, like normally when we look at this project or like in any project in open source led by um, by individuals we can say that uh, uh, we, we can say that um, uh, sorry, uh, that uh, we are asking like, hey, when Terraform 1.0 is released? Because we want it to be 1.0 for some reasons. Because... And uh, here I'm not able to ask you when uh, Terraform CDK is going to have 1.0. But when at least, or if you are able to say, when at least it will be 0.1. Like uh, where you at least have... Well, you too, that's have... not too far. Okay, not too far, and that's, so that's pretty good. Yeah, that's gonna happen soonish. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. That's uh, that's really interesting to uh, to know that uh, you have some vision for for certain features which can be implemented by zero point one and and beyond. It's really helpful to to know for some people I know, and uh, there was a comment or feedback or i don't know how it how it reads what do you mean if uh, when probably if. when problem well in any case uh i get uh, i i guess yeah it's, it's gonna yeah it's gonna happen soon um, yeah soon cool and remember this is experimental project so <laughs> um okay <laughs> And uh, I have very last uh, thing which I want you to ask is related uh, to the community involvement. Uh, can you explain how do you want to have feedback from people or how, what kind of feedback do you want to have from people? Well, yeah, first of all, uh, of course, I'm just, you know, uh, would be rather happy if people just Gonna give it a shot and see, you know, how 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 it works and uh, which issues they run into, and if they see issues, um, then um, yeah, you would be very happy about bug reports. And we had a number, like a large number of those sort of bug reports already, and uh, like a few of them were fixed, um, like mainly about you know like this process from the, going from the prior spec to the schema, so that the schema itself got a bit more stable over the last few weeks. Which is pretty good, um, but yeah. So it's the moment is really about um, collecting feedback, uh, so encouraging people to try it out, and um, you know, let us know if it's not working. And we're also happy to know if it's working, if it's great, and which features are are missing. Um, blog posts, uh, yeah, streams like this. Uh, so it's like um, all opportunities to to learn about what people are actually expecting from from project like this. Yeah. Yeah, and it's uh, quite interesting uh, that you have 114 issues open and just two pull requests. So which means <laughs> people say like, hey, there is a bug and I don't care to fix it. And uh, <clears throat> I think, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about the ratio. It's like a, like a bunch of um, long standing bugs, you know, which are sort of kept around for reference. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, I think in, in that regard, it's sometimes where we just don't support it, it supports us at the moment, right? Mm. So it's like, it's gonna happen, but yeah, uh, it's not really there yet. Yeah. And yeah, like in terms of content 
years, we do have a very active uh, contributor, uh, like an open source contributor, who actually forked my initial uh, prototype mm. and, you know, continued to work on that prototype while I was collaborating with HashiCorp. And then he contributed lots of his, um, lots of his advancements from, from, from the, from the fork and he contributed back to the Telecom CDK. So it is really, really awesome. So he did the Java support, for example, right? So, uh, and, um, he did lots of things, uh, in regards to schema stability and stuff like this, but there were like other, other contributors as well. And that's quite good. We have a bunch of. Um, you know, early adapters, which are actually using this, um, like besides from people working on this. Um, so that's also quite good. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so uh, nevertheless, there's uh, lots and lots of stuff to do. Yeah, cool. So good job, John Steinick. <laughs> and the yes, exactly. The John Steinick or however it's, uh, actually, I don't know how it's pronounced properly. Yeah. Well, me neither, but at least I, I, I read and that's how it is. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's uh, pretty cool. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please uh, write this question somewhere or you can reach out to Sebastian on Twitter, LinkedIn or any other places. Uh, I guess yeah, sure. I guess it is uh, public information anyway. So yes, yeah. so, I was happy to talk about this. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, on that one, I want to thank you very much for your time and for a really insightful uh, look into, uh, hey, what is actually Terraform CDK? At least from now on, I understand how to pronounce it, Terraform CDK, not CDK for Terraform. But, uh, well, it's, yeah, well, it, I tend to say that. Yes. Yeah, the, the confusion is that uh, in README, it says CDK for Terraform, but website is called Terraform CDK. <laughs> so I, I guess I can use uh, two things simultaneously. Yeah. Okay. It's, um, so. Yeah. Okay. So then the uh, let's uh, wrap up and uh, no questions. But I see. Uh, uh, thanks for having me. So it was great talking yeah. about this and talking to you about this. So. Yeah. One day yeah, we, and, we can meet and, and just, talk uh, face to face. It's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, at some point, hopefully next year will be yeah. great. Yes. Yeah, it is. Cool. Okay. Thanks everyone for watching and thanks, uh, Sebastian. Bye. Bye bye.